Good evening and welcome to the Center for the Study of World Religions. It's wonderful to have you here. My name's Charles Stang and I have the pleasure of serving as the director here at the Center. Um, let me remind you right now, please, to silence, and I'll do the same, silence your cell phones so we're not subjected to your terrible taste and ringtones. Um, I was at a meeting yesterday where that happened. Um, so, at the start of every academic year, the center hosts a panel on a theme or a question of relevance to the study of religion. Last year, we convened a panel on barren landscapes and open spaces, at which I spoke, uh, along with my colleague Matt Potts, and our very own HDS writer in residence, Terry Tempest Williams, who's joining us. This year's theme is writing and the art of attention. I'm delighted to welcome my colleague, Stephanie Paulsell, along with two distinguished HDS alums, CE, or Katie Morgan Guild, and Chris Adrian. I'll say more about each of them shortly, but first I'd like to say a bit more about this year's theme, writing and the art of attention. For years now, it's become increasingly clear that HDS attracts creative writers, both aspiring and accomplished writers, poets, novelists, essayists, memoirists, and everything in between. It's dawned on some of us on the faculty and in the administration that we need to respond to this impulse and this influx of talent among the students. One way HDS has already responded is to name Terry as its writer in residence. Last year, Terry offered weekly salons here at the center, and this semester she's offering a writing seminar called Writing Our Way Home, concentrated over four consecutive Monday evenings in October and November. If you're interested, you might speak to her after tonight's event. Her seminar is open to staff and students at HDS and to the community of Harvard Center for the Environment, which is hosting the seminar. Now, one way this center has responded to that student interest um, in creative writing is to launch a series on poetry, philosophy, and religion, which, among other things, supports a weekly workshop of poets from HDS and across the university and bring several prominent poets to campus each year to mentor them. It has been, I'm happy to say, a great success. And if you're interested in reading our poets, please pick up a copy of our journal, Periphery, in the lobby of the center. And if you're interested in joining the weekly poetry workshop, please speak with Shira Bloor. Is Shira here tonight? I thought I saw her. No? She is? She had to step out. Okay. Um, tonight's panel is born of a very specific conversation I had last year with Stephanie and Matt Potts. They approached me to help them imagine and to help support a creative writing track we're hoping to pilot in the MDiv program. We're interested in harnessing the interest among the students, at first among MDiv students, in how creating, creative writing not only helps them discern what their ministry might be, but how creative writing might be a form of ministry itself. This is an idea in its infancy, or at least in, in my mind. Maybe it's a toddler. Um, in any case, we've sought outside support for this venture, and in order to strengthen our own thinking and to strengthen our grant applications, we called upon the expertise of two of the Divinity School's most distinguished recent alums, namely Katie and Chris. Now, to help us grow this idea into maturity, we're thrilled to welcome Katie Morgan Guild back to HDS this year. Perhaps you know her from her books as C.E. Morgan. Katie is spending the year here part time, but will be uh, spending, uh, will be teaching a spring course entitled Writing as Ministry. She graduated from HDS in 2009 with an MTS degree, and while here, she somehow managed to write a novel. <laughs> I can't even, like, respond to my emails. Um, 
But the novel, All the Living, was published in that same year. And in 2002, she was named as one of the National Book Foundation's five under 35, and as one of the New Yorker's 20 under 40 list of fiction writers. In 2013, she received one of 10 Whiting Writers Awards recognizing exceptional talent and promise. She delivered on that promise. Her next novel, The Sport of Kings, was a finalist for the uh, Pulitzer Prize in 2017 and was the 2016 winner of the Kirkus Prize and the Wyndham Campbell Literature Prize. Katie's not the only famous fiction writer to graduate from HDS recently. Chris Adrian graduated with uh, his MTS in 2011. I'm div, terribly sorry. Um, Chris has three novels to his name. Gob's Grief, The Children's Hospital, and The Great Night as well as a collection of short stories called A Better Angel. In 2009, he received a Guggenheim Fellowship. And like Katie, in 2011, he was named as one of the New Yorker's 20 under 40. So two of the New Yorker's 2010 20 under 40 fiction writers were from Harvard Divinity School. And that is something to celebrate. Somehow, Chris managed all this while holding down a job as a physician. <laughs> Just feeling worse about myself <laughs> with you guys. <laughs> He's currently assistant professor of pediatrics at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. In an interview with the online journal Book Slut, yes, you heard that right, Book Slut. Uh, in that interview, Chris uh, borrows a phrase from Nathan Eglinder and identifies as a, quote, lapsed atheist. That's my new favorite religious identity, <laughs> and I want to lobby HDS to include it uh, in, in its options for incoming students. It might actually eclipse uh, spiritual but not religious. I'm assuming most of you know my colleague Stephanie Paul Sales, so I'll be brief. Uh, Stephanie is the Susan Shalcrofts Schwartz Professor of the Practice of Christian Studies and the author of a forthcoming book on Virginia Woolf and religion. She's also really the inspiration for this evening's panel. Some of you may have discerned in the title of this evening's panel an allusion to Simone Weil's famous essay, Reflections on the Right Use of School Studies with a View to the Love of God. Stephanie introduced me to that essay 20 years ago this month, when I started my MDiv degree at the University of Chicago under her care and supervision. That essay has been rattling around in my mind ever since, and I think you'll see why. Here is what Vey writes on the first page. Although people seem to be unaware of it today, the development of the faculty of attention forms the real object and almost the sole interest of all studies. Most school tasks have a certain intrinsic interest as well, but such an interest is secondary. All tasks which really call upon the power of attention are interesting for the same reason and to an almost equal degree. School children and students who love God should never say, for my part, I like mathematics. I like French. I like Greek. They should learn to like all these subjects because all of them develop that faculty of attention which, when directed towards God, is the very substance of prayer. This essay has influenced me in more ways than I can say, and I've turned to it many times when I'm wondering why I am memorizing declensions or verb charts or struggling through this or that ancient text. But I wonder if they was right that all forms of study cultivate attention equally. The question this panel will pursue, among others, is whether and how the craft of writing is an especially apt art of attention. That is, a means of cultivating our faculty of attention whether it be to ourselves, others, our environment, or the presence of the divine in any of these three. 
what is it about writing and the imagination and patience required of writing that helps us learn how better to attend? And what does it mean to attend to something or to someone? I think of the French, j'attends, I wait. I think attention has much to do with time, with learning to conform our time to another time, our rhythms to another's rhythms. I tend, I turn, I incline, I bend myself to where you are, how you are. J'attend, I wait on you. I submit myself to your rhythms. You, my character, you, my lover, you, my patient, you, the flower whose blooming I contemplate, the insect whose slow movements or fast I study, the sun or other stars whose courses I wish to follow. I wait on myself and the peculiar movements of my own heart and mind. And I wait on you, God, the title of Simone Weil's most famous essay. I wonder, in light of all this, what it means to say of a physician that he or she is attending. Are they really? I'll close with my favorite Christian theologian, Origen of Alexandria from the third century, arguably the high watermark for Christianity. <laughs> he regarded all of us, including angels and demons, as fallen minds. And what we fell from wasn't a garden, per se, but rapt attention to our creator, his word. And he imagines the universe we now inhabit as a hospital of sorts, a scene where those fallen minds are slowly rehabilitated. All of them, mind you, angels and demons, rehabilitated by slowly training them in the art of attention. Origen insists that it's going to take a very long time, many lives and many worlds in succession, a long time before we learn to fully attend again. But there's no other way back. The question this panel poses for me then, in an Origenist idiom, is this. How do we write our way back to our beginning? Or as Terry might put it, how do we write our way home? So, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to invite each of our panelists to take the podium and speak, after which we will bring their three chairs here, and they will field questions from you all. So I believe I have the order right. We go Katie, Stephanie, Chris. Is that right? Katie, Chris, Stephanie. OK. Thank you very much for coming, and please join me in welcoming Katie Morgan Guile. Hello. It's lovely, lovely, lovely to be back. Last time I was here, we were doing a panel on, I want to say chaplaincy and writing. Um, Chris and I get to come together every couple of years and talk about our favorite subjects. We're very lucky to, to intersect that way occasionally. Um, and especially tonight to be with Stephanie, who taught both of us. It's especially wonderful to be here. Um, I, I believe I'm going first because I'm establishing some definitions that immediately arise once we start talking about attention. Um, you know, under the umbrella of attention, as soon as you begin thinking about it, you realize there are varieties of attention that are worth speaking to. Um, I'm going to talk about four. I think you could really subdivide almost endlessly into various forms of focus and concentration and attention. But these four, I believe, are the most pertinent for what we're talking about tonight. So you have outer awareness, uh, which allows for kind of fluid reception of the broad outer world. Um, and I'm borrowing from Daniel Goleman, who's done a lot of work on emotional intelligence. Um, he's also written on focus and attention. Um, you have selective attention, what we would call focus. So the narrowing of the aperture, in our case on a book or a manuscript, something like that. 
There's imaginative rumination or free-flowing attention, which is a kind of unstructured and speculative attention. Uh, it's unfocused and almost like, you know, a waking dream. And this is the place where books are born. This is the place where eureka moments emerge from. Um, then we have inner attention. So that's the focus on your immediate inner thoughts and feelings um, as they occur somatically, as uh, you know, in the attendant language that emerges um, from the language regions of the brain. So those are the, the forms of attention I'm, I'm going to actually think about in terms of writing. So the question at hand, does writing develop attention? Uh, it seems incontrovertible that writing develops sustained focus. Um, it's a marvelous thing because excellence and accomplishment are impossible without this kind of sustained focus that allows you to create a 500-page manuscript or a 200-page manuscript or a 12-line poem. Um, but that blade can certainly cut you. Um, it can really render you habitually hyper-focused on the abstract. Um, there you have the, you know, the stereotype of the absent-minded professor whose neural pathways are so deeply grooved for abstract concentration that they don't notice what's going on around them. Um, this, is, this is a loss to community life, regardless of the academic output, or in, in our case, regardless of the quality of the creative output, that's a huge loss um, to a community when a person can't attend to the outer. It also strikes me as unquestionable that writing is going to develop your imaginative or your free wandering attention. So this is your wild, unrestrained, you know, highly connective, strange, nonsensical, um, but deeply connective space of imagination. So in this state, we might not be present to the outer world in a way that mindfulness training would encourage, um, but we are deeply present to this rich potential in the inner landscape. Um, again, the birthplace of books. You're tending in a very free way to whatever might arise. Uh, the double edge, of course, is that it can foment an overdevelopment of fantasy. Uh, so this emotional reliance on dreamscape, uh, where the subject enjoys, you know, kind of a superabundance of control, and that really is a, an emotional risk for writers, but it's also a risk for um, shy people and introverts, too. It's not just a writer thing. Uh, so inner attention, inner life, the turn of the gaze inward, the experience of emotion as it transpires all over the material body, uh, the attendant language that we produce in the prefrontal cortex. Since for most writers, writing involves this complex interplay between imagination and motion, lived experience, and the emotional lives of both character and self, and this, I think, is an emergent process that um, is basically dependent co-arising in action in the creative arts. Um, um, the risk here is probably obvious, especially if you've met many writers. Uh, you can encounter a self-focus so intense that at best it looks selfish, and at worst it looks pathologically narcissistic. Um, however, you know, when this sort of inner attention is cultivated, it's finely honed, and it's situated in an ethical structure that a person has chosen, then you might be in the presence of someone who's very psychologically wise, um, whose insights are grounded in a very honest and rigorous um, self-examination. That's kind of a holy grail of character for people who do this kind of interior work, and it does require a lot of interior work. So what's left is what you might call situational or outer awareness. And um, for the Buddhists, this would be what we might think of as active concentration when they speak of two modes of concentration. Present to what's happening, all of what's happening. Um, and this, unfortunately, is where I think writing often fails us, more often than not. Um, writing simply demands such extraordinary output in terms of time invested in selective or focus, imaginative and inner attention, that it doesn't necessarily uh, encourage well-rounded neural usage. And this is very obviously highly dependent on the writer, the kind of writer you are, the kind of person you're born as, the, and what you've cultivated in your life. Um, I think of this as full spectrum seeing. You know, the ability to notice and be regularly attendant to the outer world. And this kind of seeing, which is 
a super generous, almost devotional attention to the world around us is, again, to, to focus on community life. It's critical to community life. And it's critical to a rich personal life. And this is the crux of the issue for me. And what, if you walk away remembering nothing, maybe this is what I would want you to remember. That to become proficient in, even brilliant in an art is laudable. But to make your life an art is remarkable. I mean, that is the great art. And attending to the outer world is indispensable. Uh, so it follows, how do we, how would we develop this particular kind of awareness? Owning that it's going to depend on the person. Some people are going to be extraordinarily good at this even while writing, but I think in my experience and in knowing other writers, this is the one that's often missing or atrophied. Um, and I believe the way to develop this is through a regular spiritual practice, most particularly one that explicitly develops it. And for those who know me, this is the horse I like to whip. You know, the spiritual life or the religious life for the writer, uh, which I think is a vital component of stabilizing the famously, deservedly, famously erratic lives of writers. Um, a piece of what I want to do here at HDS is work on self-care and writing, or what I think of as self-chaplaincy for writers. Um, so that people can develop the skills that are necessary to really survive the craft of writing. And I don't use those words lightly. Uh, we just lose so many artists. We lose them to suicide too often. We lose far too many to alcoholism and other intoxicants very broadly understood. Um, from internet addiction to uh, unloving relationships that sap energy and destroy the quietude that's absolutely necessary for a writer's life. That's a whole nother. Um, right now, I'd just like to look briefly at meditation and maybe just touch very briefly on yogic philosophy, um, not just because meditation develops outer attention in addition to focus, um, or as in many yoga um, practices, you know, strengthens the entire house so that you can see out, out the windows better. Um, but because as these practices are popularized in the West, and they've become accessible to innumerable people of other faith traditions, you know, not just Buddhists and not just yogis. This is important for anyone who's a little bit allergic to <laughs> talk of spirituality and religion. And of course, as most people at HDS know, you know, this population is not immune to that. There are many people here for a kind of immersion therapy <laughs> for their allergy. Um, so simply, very simply put, meditation, and here you might want to just narrow down to mindfulness meditation, really does have a beautiful capacity to grow outer awareness. And the irony is, unlike many other tasks, it does, seems to do so even when it expressly develops focus. Um, so how does it do this when you're, say, spending 20 minutes or two hours just focused on the breath? Uh, well, I mean, the mechanism is mysterious. I mean, the, the formal study of meditation is really in its infancy here um, in the West. But um, this is an interesting study that I, I saw recently that showed that mindfulness meditation and hatha yoga, and we're just talking postures and breathing, only two of the limbs of the eight limbs of yoga, um, improve cognitive function in ways that reading, quiet reading, did not. I found fascinating, and they couldn't explain it. They don't, they don't really know why. Um, but one thing that we do know is that meditation practice helps restore parasympathetic regulation. Um, and so from you know, a purely physiological level, and this is where many in the West, of course, are really comfortable talking about um, these traditions, we're going to be better able to serenely encounter this outer world when we're not overloaded with cortisol and adrenaline when your parasympathetic system is in charge. Um, so this is good news for people who integrate only one aspect of these traditions into their life, short meditation, a little bit of um, asana or yoga posture. Um, yeah, and these studies are often looking at meditation in the John Kabat-Zinn mode, so mindfulness. There are many, many forms of meditation, as we all know, um, but that's what they're usually looking at. But for those who live Buddhism and yoga as religion, and of course there's a lot of talk about how these are not religions, but I'm using religion here 
in a way um, to say a set of views which pervades every aspect of one's life. So an understanding of the nature of being so global that compartmentalization becomes impossible. So a, a truly a self-transcendent practice. Then the effects of mindfulness are far more profound because as Buddhist practitioners know, meditation is not about the cushion. And this is Thich Nhat Hanh. Meditation on interdependence is to be practiced constantly, not only while sitting, but as an integral part of our involvement in all ordinary tasks. So to hold the fact of interdependence, the fact of dependent co-arising before you as you move through your day in all matters large and small, and of course that distinction is false, um, you will naturally build your outer awareness because to do otherwise would be to move in a counter rhythm to the music of your bone deep convictions about the nature of being. So intention matters here. You strive not to become anesthetized, not intoxicated, uh, not hypervigilant, not dissociated. And if you're aiming for integrity of your inner convictions with your outer behavior in a faith tradition that values interdependence, you look, you engage, you attempt to be in the dance of life moment to moment. Because your actions, you understand that your actions have myriad seen and unseen ramifications, unavoidable. So an ethic inevitably emerges from the fact of inevitability. Uh, so when you're dancing with your partner, you don't zone out or lose awareness of them. In myriad small ways, you are paying attention to the pressure of their hands, you're watching their eyes, you're sensing their feet, you're sensing what's happening to the band and the tempo. Um, you know, Zen as a dance has probably been overdone, but it's a, still a solid metaphor for the development of attention in writers. All forms of attention need to be balanced and functional so that you are moving with elegance and dynamism through your life and your work. Um, you know, I really do believe that most writers really do require work on this particular faculty. Um, and a fully developed life demands this well-roundedness and again, that is what we are really talking about. We shouldn't live to write. We should write to live more fully, to live better. You know, to develop our art only is too small. You know, make your life the art. And that's why when I'm asked how to develop this faculty in the writer, my first impulse is not to say meditate, but rather to develop a spiritual life that incorporates mindfulness and meditation because the fully religious life, when lived beautifully, and to do so may be the greatest challenge in life, it disallows compartmentalization. Insight into the nature of being is meant to pervade, inform, transform, transform everything. The writing, the discussions, the walking, the nursing of a child, the grocery shopping, the maintenance of friendships, and of course, as every good subject should do, when we start talking about writing, we quick quickly broaden out to everything because within the seemingly narrow confines of a subject, you find the world. There really is no compartmentalization. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I can't. Uh, quite express how, how really lovely it is to be back here. I have um, uh, such an enduring affection for this place and this community. Um, I was reminded of it on the way over when I, I got lost on the way from Harvard Square. I was in kind of a hurry. I was too proud to look at my, at my phone, to look at a map, and so sort of bumped around on Trail Bridge going, Aslan, Aslan, let me back in. Um, um, so it's it, it it it's lovely just to be here, even if I was just loiter, even if I had just come to loiter, um, in the Sperry room. Um, uh, but it's really exciting uh, to be part of this conversation and uh, and 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 with these uh, with this group of people. Um, we've been uh, like Johnny mentioned, we've been having these conversations informally, and they're always really uh, really really thrilling. Um, so it's neat to finally get to to sort of bring them to the to the wider community. Um, I would like to 
uh, or I hope to talk about at least, um, uh, by means of my own example, maybe um, uh, what I think the sort of M what I think of as the sort of MDiv and MFA worlds, um, how they how they might um, uh, communicate with, affect, uh, sustain, and um, is Carrie here? Oh, hi, Carrie. <laughs> um, a word that a word that Carrie taught me. Um, taught me not to um, um, not to yell and scream every time I heard anymore um, when I was a first year here. Nourish, nourish each other. Um, uh, and so I think, and what I'll what I'll try to express is is some part of how uh, my divinity education or my divinity style education, which I think started even before I got here, um, changed and refined. Um, my own understanding and practice of what of what writerly attention is. I mean, I can put it that way. Once in a graduate fiction workshop, I turned in part of a novel about a young man who finds himself suddenly at the mercy of a group of mysterious editors who goad and threaten him into writing a novel. He tries to escape them, fleeing from darkest Florida to Western Europe. They catch up with him on a train traveling from Berlin to Vienna, and stealthily remove one of his hands while he's sleeping. The next day, a porter gives him an envelope containing a picture of his hand suspended in one of those barbershop jars of blue disinfecting fluid with a note saying, you can have it back when we see chapter five. <laughs> Reactions from my peers, a wonderful bunch of people whose opinions I genuinely cherished and feared, ranged from, this is very strange and I'm not sure how to react to it, to, this is very strange, and I'm not sure how to react to it. <laughs> but when it came time for the teacher to speak, she said, this is about the poignancy of the human body. It wasn't my turn yet to talk. Like in every workshop, the writer was supposed to reserve her questions or comments for the end of the class, but I couldn't help blurting out, it is? <laughs> yes, she said, it is. As I remember, she didn't say a great deal more than that. About it, she didn't need to. Suddenly, everyone had something more to add about the piece. We spent some time trying to remember together what exactly that blue barbershop disinfecting fluid was called. Later that evening, one of my classmates said of our teacher, she sure sees the best in everything, doesn't she? <laughs> and I said, she sure does. You must understand that he wasn't trying to sit on my cake. He wasn't suggesting that the teacher was merely being flattering. It happened in every class that this teacher presented us with some treasure out of our own writing that we hadn't quite realized was there. He may as well have said, she sees as we do not see. And I may as well have said, amen. Because that was our common experience of being read by this person, of being appraised and attended to, not just by a narrative intelligence, which could see beyond the horizons of the story you were struggling to tell, and perceive its utmost implications, but also of being acknowledged by a soul whose wonderstruck affection for creation illuminated your fledgling attempts to represent your own creatureliness, your transcendent joys and despairs. Of course, I didn't really understand what she meant when she told me what she thought my stories were about. It would be years before I started to understand. I haunted her office hours as part of the early attempt, approaching her every time with a thrilling combination of eagerness and terror, but once I sat down with her, I mostly spent the time blushing and staring at my shoes. My shoes squeaked all through my early adulthood, so she always had plenty of warning when I was slouching down the long, brutalist corridors of our English philosophy building. I never actually asked her to explain what she meant about that story or any other. I think I understood at least that it would be my job to discover what she meant, and not hers to explain it to me. At some point in our one-sided conversation, she overturned my Catholic understanding that Protestants were mysterious, mythical creatures who may or may not actually exist. And my understanding of Protestant theology is all occurring at some distance beyond a sign marked wrong turn. I started reading John Calvin, barely comprehending what he was saying either, though falling quickly enough under his influence that I began to have a recurring dream in which a chasm opened underneath our English philosophy building and every member of my class seemed likely to be swallowed up by the abyss until the teacher rode up on a Harley Davidson and began by means of long chains which she wielded like whips to fetch people away from perdition. She seemed to be selecting them at random but I knew within the dream that it was all actually a lot more complicated than that. I won't try to describe everything that teacher gave me not to understand 
but I bring her up this evening because it occurred to me in thinking about what I might usefully say in this company and in this room, that this was, if not the first, certainly the most important time that someone looked at me and saw beyond the boundaries of the self I thought was all of me. My teacher's attention was a writer's attention deployed for the sake of her student to awaken in him this same faculty of writerly attention. It was a real peculiar experience to have such an exalted person that strike up a conversation with parts of me that absolutely transcended the ordinary boundaries of my ego. I felt eventually like I had been made a gift of a pair of two big squeaky shoes and the challenge to grow into them. With the floppy gait of a clown, I wandered about in them for years. Divinity School was not the strangest place they took me. But it was probably the best place in the world I could have landed to continue to develop the strange faculty of writerly attention, which was also more broadly a faculty of aesthetic attention. More broadly yet, it's a faculty of sacred attention. So I didn't learn that until I came to HDS, and I didn't understand what that meant until long after I had left. It wasn't what I came here for. I was never really all that sure while I was here why I was here. Though I had some imprecisely formed, imprecisely formed ideas about learning things in div school I couldn't learn in a hospital and finally figuring out how many Puritans it takes to screw in a light bulb. <laughs> but somewhere between never doing my Greek homework and falling asleep in introduction to ministry studies and waking up in introduction to ministry studies long enough to stare at the back of Matt Potts' head and wonder if Matt were a Smurf or a Care Bear, what kind of Smurf or Care Bear <laughs> would Matt be? My peers and teachers began to exercise an influence on me similar to the influence of my old teacher. We can talk later about, it can be a raffle, we'll answer that question about Matt. Um, my peers and teachers began to exercise an influence on me similar to the influence of my old teacher. They honored and attended to parts of me about which I had only minimal awareness, the parts of me that were contiguous with the divine. And I managed to remain in more or less complete denial of the divine, even as the parts of me that were contiguous with it grew and flourished in this atmosphere under this attention. My MFA teacher recognized and encouraged my efforts to create and manage a relationship with otherness and transcendent being but only within the confines of my writing. My MDiv teachers treated these efforts as the substrate out of which a vocation is formed and tested. The MDiv program recognized my writing as a spiritual endeavor and by asking me to put it in conversation with a sense of myself in the world, enabled it to perform as a tool of spiritual discernment, which transformed my understanding of who I was. Not entirely by design and yet not accidentally either, it fostered my maturation as an artist because it helped me understand why I write and helped me locate myself in relation to my writing and to the visible and invisible human world. I never took a unit of clinical pastoral education while I was an MDiv student despite persistent encouragements that I should do so. The way it was recommended to me was usually something in the spirit of, you should take CPE, it will really give you a nervous breakdown. My reply was usually something like, well, I've already had a number of those, <laughs> so I think I'll pass. I came to it eventually very late, and while I had no further, further nervous breakdowns, I did have a very hard time with it. I think of CPE now as the really transformative step in my understanding of writerly aesthetic and sacred attention, as the process that really convinced me in practice that these are all aspects of a continuum. CPE didn't just presume to attend to and communicate with the parts of me inaccessible to my usual habits of identification. It insisted that I start to inhabit or cooperate with them as part of the project of achieving a sincerely compassionate presence for another human being. Very slowly, very, very slowly, I came to accept as true an empirical experience in which these parts of me could actually do something, something besides just writing. The part of me which felt sometimes distant to the point of infinity from my ordinary self, which asserted and maintained the meaning of my work as an artist, turned out to be the same part that asserted and maintained the meaning of my life when I tried, however flailingly, to hold for a patient a space congenial to hope, to despair, to anger, to joy, to sadness, and to love. 
I suppose this is all to say that I believe writing cultivates and strengthens the art of attention, not only because writing as a discipline is by itself iterative of or synonymous with attention. I was made a writer by someone who gave me the gift of her sacred attention. The fledgling aspect of myself which received this attention was fostered in a program of ministerial education and finally called on to stand up and act within the context of CPE. And this aspect of myself, don't ask me if it's my soul or I'll take off my shirt and start to display <laughs> embarrassing spiritual agonies in front of all of you. It writes, but it is not just a writer. And the artist's face is only one of its many faces. Thanks. Thank you, Chris and Katie and Charlie. Um, it's extraordinary to look at these three people and think they were all my students and now they're all my friends and teachers. You're very lucky, I think, if you get to say that. Um, when, I, when Charlie first suggested this panel, actually the first story that came to me was a story about Chris um, and Emily Click. Um, one of Chris's teachers. Um, in OMS, we always eagerly ran out and read every story, book, everything Chris published. And um, when, he, when his third novel was published, The Great Night, which is about Tatiana and Oberon from A Midsummer Night's Dream bringing the changeling who is desperately ill to a hospital for care. Um, Emily and I read it and were talking about it. And she looked at me and she said, can you imagine how closely Chris had to listen to sick children and their parents to write this book. Um, that's the story that came to me, although I didn't put it in this talk, I wanted to tell it. <laughs> um, I've learned a lot about attention from all three of these people. Last year I heard the writer Minna Zalman Proctor read from her new book in the Harvard bookstore. She writes nonfiction, but in the form of short stories, true stories, she calls them. When she was asked at the reading about the difference between teaching students how to write fiction and how to write nonfiction, she said, well, fiction students are often told to make their writing more richly imagined, while nonfiction students are told to make theirs more richly observed. And she described for us a writing exercise that she had learned as a student to try to cultivate these capacities. She said, if you're trying to describe something that happens in a room, you send your attention all the way around it. You ask, what does this room look like? What does it smell like? How warm or cool is it? Where do the light and the shadows fall? What's the feeling in the room? What's the atmosphere? who's in the room and what's in the room and what is the shape of the space between them. You send your attention into every corner of the room, she said, asking these questions. You begin in one spot and then you sweep systematically all the way around the edges. And then she said, you do it again and find out what you missed the first time. And then you do it again. And then you do it again. Now this sounds as much like a spiritual exercise as a writing exercise to me because it's an exercise that acknowledges that no matter how many times we move our eyes or our imaginations around the room, no matter how richly we observe or imagine, there's always going to be something that eludes us. It will always be worth going around again because there will always be something we missed. And even more than that, there will always be something inaccessible to our imagination and observation, no matter how finely honed it is, a kind of excess presence that makes itself felt as we return again and again to the same room, the same landscape, the same life, but that remains just a little bit out of our reach. Now as teachers and students, we've all experienced the way that the unknowable more can haunt a room or a text or a history. We feel it in our incomplete attempts to understand what we study and in our methodologies that both reveal and conceal. In our line of work, 
the best scholarship is marked by both the profound knowledge that comes with devoted study and the humility that acknowledges the limits of our knowing. The most elegant, convincing arguments are never completely watertight, but instead leave a door or window cracked open to allow possibilities as yet unimagined to enter and possibly transform the whole business. But speaking for myself, I'm not always sure how to inhabit in my classroom that liminal space between what we know and what we can't. I may cherish the unknowable more, but as a teacher, I want to know what I'm talking about, especially with you smart people. I lean more often in the classroom, I think, toward what I can know. And my students take a cue from that and lean toward the knowable themselves. This year, I am trying to think more explicitly about how better to cultivate attention in writing and in teaching to the inaccessible. And this week, I got some help in one of my classes about this um, from the life of Anthony, the story of an Egyptian desert monk whose life, as it was told and retold, inspired other people to walk out of the cities and into the wilderness to seek God. His biographer, Bishop Athanasius of Alexandria, describes a scene in which some young monks visit Anthony on his mountain and ask him to give them some instructions about how they could live like he does. He tells them to love God, to guard their thoughts, to pray constantly, to meditate on scripture and the deeds of the saints, to sing holy songs while they're falling asleep and then again when they wake up. And every day, he tells them, examine yourself through writing. He urges these young monks to write down both their actions and the stirrings of their souls as if they were reporting to each other about them. Think of your writing as the eyes of your fellow ascetics, Anthony says. Let yourself be visible in your writing. Let yourself be seen. What we learn from Anthony's instructions, the historian of philosophy Pierre Adot says, is that a person writing is no longer alone, but is part of the silently present human community. Now that's what I want for myself and for my students, to feel ourselves part of the silently present human community. And I'm drawn to works of art that experiment with ways of invoking that silent presence. In 2016, the artist William Kentridge created a frieze of Roman history using reverse graffiti on the wall that runs along the Tiber River called Triumphs and Laments. It's not chronological, so an image of the crucifixion of St. Peter stands next to an image of women mourning their dead on the island of Lampedusa after making the dangerous journey across the Mediterranean. An image of Roman soldiers bearing aloft the treasures they stole from the temple after sacking Jerusalem in the first century sits alongside images of Jews being tormented in Piazza Navona in the Middle Ages. Romulus and Remus, Piero Pasolini, Marcus Aurelius, St. Teresa in ecstasy all make an appearance in this historical procession. But one of the most arresting images in that frieze is a simple dark panel on wheels. Across it is scrawled the words, quello che non ricordo, what I can't remember, which of course is most of history. Most stories are not remembered by us, not written down in books, not displayed on walls for us to ponder. In the midst of a procession of images of some of the most well-known stories in human history, Kentridge asks us to turn our attention to all that has been forgotten, histories that we will never know. He reminds us that it is not just, or perhaps even primarily, the emperors on their horses that have moved history forward, but the lives of the unremembered, the relationships they forged, their hopes and aspirations, their triumphs and laments. 
Alejandra Oliva, where are you? There you are. Um, shared with me another work that brings its attention to inaccessible history that she had read in a class with Amy Hollywood last year on poetry and the archive. The poet M. Norbese Phillips' uh, book, Zong. The Zong was a British slave ship whose captain, in 1781, ordered the murder by drowning of more than 150 souls on board so that the owners of the ship could collect the insurance money. There's only one public document related to this atrocity in the historical archive, a legal decision called Gregson versus Gilbert. Philip shatters that document and reassembles it to create an account of a largely hidden trauma, as well as a lament and a cry of anguish. Through writing, she offers a way to mourn a past atrocity in the present. And her attention to those silenced voices makes a claim on us, her readers. Alejandra followed Imnorbese Philip in her own project for my class, where she took an essay by Simone Bay, not the attention one, but the, um, the essay on the Lord's Prayer where they meditates on each phrase of the Lord's Prayer. And Alejandra took that and broke it apart and then created a new essay on prayer out of Simone Weil's words in a different order, which illuminated some silences and some inaccessibilities that we had not been able to get at before. So all of these works, um, Phillips, Kentridge, Oliva, they point the way forward to forms of writing and also forms of reading and also forms of teaching that cultivate the capacity for attention both to what we know and what we do not, both about ourselves and about others, to follow our imaginations to the boundaries of what we know and then to press on even further, to imagine the lives of those whose history has been forgotten as well as those in our own day and age whose unfolding history we ignore. To remember that our triumphs and laments are interwoven with those of others, that we are implicated in the lives of others, including those whose histories are no longer <coughs> accessible to us. And to write our way, and to create our way, to reassemble our way into the silent presence of the human community that stretches behind and ahead of us. Now, the unknowable more that Anthony of Egypt was talking about to his monks, of course, was the unknowable more in themselves. No matter how thoroughly we explore our interior landscape and in self-examination each day, there will always be things about ourselves, Anthony says, that only God can comprehend. But through writing, he suggests, we learn to feel our way along the unknown parts of ourselves toward God, in whose memory every forgotten thing is held, and whose attention opens the possibility, like Chris's MFA teacher, that we are more than we know ourselves to be. All right, questions or comments? Yes, please. Uh, I learned part of the school and you really like sound like me. Okay. Uh, what I'm trying to find out is suppose I'm, I want to write uh, an autobiographical account of my entire family and family mm -hmm. of my grandchildren. So, like, you know, you speak about uh, how do we find our way back home, back to our beginnings? Um, Writing memoir? I mean, yeah, this is a private account from my own branches. Wow, Chris, have you written memoir? Have you written autobiographical? Explicitly autobiographical? Um, no essays. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think my, maybe one thing it can, uh, I mean, yeah, this actually go, maybe it might go beyond just that, um, just the, uh, the exercise of, but the discipline of, uh, of memoir. But I think that there's, 
Or what I, or what, I, what my experience with my um, uh, students of writing, or the thing that I encourage them to do, and they sort of look at me cross-eyed, um, or just uh, put their heads down and um, um, and, and get very quiet, um, is I, I ask them to just sort of cons look at the consider that whatever you're writing, whatever it is, if it's a page, if it's a sentence, if it's a paragraph, if it's a page, if it's the whole thing. Um, that it actually, that it has its own independent existence and it's telling you something that you don't know. Um, and there's this, and then maybe that's another, another way to think about that kind of attention or this like ex extraordinary stillness that, that you start to approach where, and I guess maybe we didn't, I mean the word humility didn't, humility didn't come up. Um, I was a little embarrassed up there occasionally. Um, but uh, uh, I think at that, 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 that point where um, where it's starting, to, it's starting to tell you something about yourself. And I can imagine, and, and actually this has happened for me because I've had students who, they come to a fiction class, they're writing a memoir, and they say, well, I'll, 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 I'll tell you what I know about writing fiction, and you can use it in your memoir, is that they start to, um, what that they start to, they may not entirely know what they want to say to their grandchildren. They may start just with a regular story, but then the piece starts to talk to them about what they actually want to say. Um, which uh, initially it's, un it's unspoken. It's actually it might even be just in the context of the relationship, and it never would have been. It might not, it, and it maybe it never would have been articulated. Maybe it didn't need to be articulated. But but often it's a great gift that it actually does get articulated. And there's something else, something else that's even deeper and and, and more unspoken waiting to be communicated. Anyway, does, that, does any of this sound like it? Does that make any sense at all? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay. It's, it's sort of telling you that you don't know where you're really going to go with this mm -hmm. when you're going to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, uh, hands up high if I... Yes. Very the other way in the back here. Um, I was wondering, how do you write uh, or pay attention to the unwritable? Or what, what is impossible to pay attention to? Yeah. I, 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 the example of this is all the post-Holocaust Jewish writers yeah. writing about the survivors writing about the Holocaust, or for you three, well, are there things in your life that you're unwilling to write about or unwilling mm -hmm. to pay attention to? Mm -hmm. um, how do you do deal with that? Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, this goes back to what I was saying about self-care. Um, because you sit with extraordinary suffering when you touch the untouchable. And it has profound ramifications in your own emotional life. And, um, I mean, there's a reason so many people turn to intoxicants in the broad sense of the word when they're writing, because it's, there are extraordinary challenges that accompany writing. And it's not just touching the untouchable sometimes, depending on what your subject matter is, um, but it's the public nature of it, too and vulnerability to being shamed, publicly criticized, publicly, these sorts of things. Um, I think that uh, whatever your spiritual core is, I mean, a, a daily spiritual practice that keeps you afloat when you're sitting with tremendous suffering, whether it's your own trauma or trauma that you're looking at, and then taking on in some sense. Uh, to say, you know, as writing has become professionalized, I mean, there are MFA programs all over the country now, I mean, 60 years ago there were not, and um, as writing has become professionalized, what's fallen away, or uh, what has never been there, rather, is this idea that it is a healthy profession and that self-care is critical for it. I don't know if he's answering your question, but it certainly speaks to me because I've dealt with this, as he said, extremely difficult material that ravages the psyche, you know, it just really does. I mean, um, there are many reasons so many writers don't survive that tough work. Um, I don't know if Stephanie Press can say that. I think, I, I think anything can, you can anything can be represented. Um, uh, you know, and that, um, so I think if the, if, I think for me, there's, there, there's there are things where I'm like, oh, that's so. Uh, uh, I can't. That's that. that uh, there are things that are untouchable. There are also things that I just don't. I still don't even. I, I, I don't even know. I can't even approach consciously, probably. 
Um, but I but I think if you but but so that notion of representation and really leaves a lot of space open for me. That I can do it right, I can do it wrong. I can uh, um, uh, I can only get part of it. it. It takes some of the pressure off. But the other, I think the most important thing, and maybe go, maybe you think of it, a kind of like one of the earlier conversations I remember um, about this uh, was at Henry's table um, um, with Katie, I and mean, I probably I was probably on like my forty seventh oyster over there side of the French buffet. <laughs> Um, and maybe a little intoxicated, um, um, but that notion of you don't—you also don't have to do it alone, um, and that's I mean part of like the, the maybe the, like that the, the sort of mythology that the Katie was talking that was talking about. I think that there, maybe as writers, I mean, maybe the MFA program celebrates neurosis in a way that, that kind of bothers me because people think that you have to that they that neurosis and and suffering. Unhealed. Um, get, mm, Unhealed suffering mm, um, is the source. And, and like trauma, people uh, like trauma is is valued but not really cared for at right. all. And this is a totally different environment. Many people, I mean, they won't, they won't, they won't hurt anybody's feelings if they say probably many of the people that come to this place to learn to help other people have, uh, need help themselves, um, and they find it here. Um, not directly. I mean, that's certainly not the way that I got it. Nobody came up to me. Well, maybe a few people came up to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but mostly it was just the way that, I mean, it was a mod it, 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 people began immediately to model a particular kind of care for me, in which they were, they, I was held. Um, I was not, I was occasionally held that way in my, in my writing training. But the idea of, of, of doing both of those, of, of actually um, fostering that kind of talent, in this environment is really exciting. Um, and also, the, the, the idea of giving, um, of fostering those kinds of, of creative tools for future ministers or future scholars or religion, for future whatevers, because there are a lot of whatevers here too, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, it's good to me. Is that, is that answering at all? Touching what you Yeah. Uh, okay. I, Stephanie, were you going to pass on that? I, okay. Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, this idea for a creative writing track in the end it really came from Katie and Chris yep. when they were students because they, they said precisely this, that when you're studying to be a minister, you do CPE, you have to confront your own brokenness, your own trauma to be able to help other people. And writers who are also sitting with trauma, their character's trauma, their own yeah. trauma, um, and who whose work is in service of the human family, um, often don't get that yeah. kind of uh, yeah. help. I had a singing teacher who always said, um, to, move po to move people, you have to be moving. Mm -hmm. And people in trauma are often frozen. So for your work to move, for your work to be moving and fluid, there's a healing is really required. Yes, sir. First of all, thank you for your wonderful sharing. And um, I'm first year student here, so many papers to write. Yes. And so <laughs> yeah. um, could you share with me and with us um, some of your advice and strategy or how to like how to apply attention or how attention reflects into our academic papers? Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Um, I think, first of all, I would say really give yourself permission to write about the things that you really care about. And um, don't, don't think you have to, you know, um, fit your interests to the interests of, of your teacher necessarily. Um, give yourself plenty of, start early, that's my best advice, <laughs> um, so, that you, so that you have plenty of time to just sit down and write and see what, what surfaces, what bubbles up. Um, I mean, I think this is related to your question about the memoir writing, too, yeah. that um, often it's not until we sit down and br try to bring this kind of attention to something that we care about, something we love, something we're interested in, um, we often have a lot more to say than we think we do. We often can remember a lot more than we think we can. We were just reading Augustine today in my class where we were reading Anthony before, and Augustine says, you know, my memory is like this huge space folded on itself. You know, you just, this enormous space, and I can't see to all the ends of it. 
Um, but in, you know, if there's time to, and time is the hardest commodity to find here, um, but if you can start early enough to let yourself write freely without worrying about whether it's turning into a paper or not, um, you'll find out what, what is it most interesting to you and what you care most about. Sure. Well, uh, I, really, I really appreciate that the culture in Athens, of course, is a sort of beautiful way to do it, to writing making open to you. Yeah. Yeah. And I personally also do that. The, the, uh, I don't know if you remember the journals and all the Yes, I do. This, those are something that I will share with my team. Like this concept of sharing and being open to others. I think. It's, but I, I really wonder: did, did he still really do that? Did he write that journal? Are there real examples, or is there like this kind of spiritual writing that you know of that we can do? You know, it's funny because his biographer goes to such great lengths to say that he's illiterate and just, you know, is, has oh. everything in his mind. But then he then he has him to have give this teaching about writing, um, which is kind of it's interesting. Um, we don't have any of Anthony's writings. What we have, though, are the, you know some of his sayings that allegedly his students wrote down, and we have this hagiography um, that a bishop with various agendas wrote and so I think Anthony shines through probably in various places. Say a group of spiritual person and they really write their actions and steer of the stirrings of their soul, that's right. Yeah, I mean basically I think, you know, what that what that teaching is saying is write about what's inside you and also what's outside of you, what the way you're moving your body through the world. And um, bring your attention to that and think of it as the eyes of your your fellow ascetics. Um, that writing brings you into the public in some way um, and turns you toward the world. Um, we do have uh, seven letters of Anthony. Oh, we do have seven letters? Yeah, they're, they're of somewhat, they're somewhat disputed, but you might like them. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it, what, what, what matters also matters, not what you go, what you write to, to the world, but yeah. something that you dare not to share yet. And that's a really, like he, uh, he said, a way to examine. You know, you know he's, what, what he seems to be saying there is that writing itself, the practice of writing itself, um, brings us, it brings us into some sort of presence. It, it brings the human community uh, around us somehow. And there's arguments about this. Michel Foucault read that. He has a whole essay on self-writing where he starts with that teaching from Anthony and he says this is about, you know, this personal work that one does in oneself. And his teacher, Pierre Addo, said, no, it's about um, turning toward the world. It's about an ethical, you know, formation um, through writing. Hi, thanks so much. Um, so I was wondering if you uh, would be willing to share any thoughts or insights on attention to the suffering of others. Um, so something like witness as opposed to pathos or empathy. So, so writing about sensory experiences, kind of like a shared uh, sensory community versus writing from the perspective of someone else, mm -hmm. like from a, a moral other. Mm -hmm. And maybe even if the, the whole concept of like another is ethically or spiritually mm -hmm. problematic mm -hmm. in itself. Mm -hmm. Do you mean in fiction? Yes. Yeah. Or, I guess, yeah, writing. Imagining another life. Right, exactly. Yeah. 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 Maybe the fiction writers. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you be a little more specific? Um, so, uh, whether it's, if there's something problematic of when when you're trying to write, and it doesn't even have to be from first person, but it could be like a poster from the experience of someone else. Mm -hmm. So someone uh, to express their, their suffering mm -hmm. um, sort of differentiates between, you know, when you read writing where um, the reader will feel that they experience to some extent what, what's going on from this character's perspective, as opposed to uh, experiencing what would be like a one-dimensional like, caricature. And, 
almost like that. That seems to be what delineates like uh, really great fiction writing from you know someone who's just maybe starting out. Yeah, are you asking how it's done, or if it's more yeah, of a problem? If, yeah. Uh, so like, if it's ethically problematic, yeah. and if it is, why? Yeah. Or yeah. if not, how is it done well? A lot of people find it morally problematic. What I find is there's nothing that's not other, including what we think of as a the constitute itself. Yeah. There is no such thing as ultimately, and this depends on your um, where you situate yourself spiritually and in faith traditions where I tread. Um, it's the, what's morally problematic is to imagine the self as so distinct that someone else could actually be other. Um, so there's work for me as a fiction writer. Um, there is a complete fluidity between all beings, and um, I think for me it's more morally problematic to imagine that there are ultimate dividing lines. This is what Simone Weil is after in that essay. But what what she says is. Um, that attention, she, what she's talking about, uh, not just writing, but just studying generally. So she says, no matter what you're studying, whether you're studying physics or mathematics or theology or whatever, that if, as long as you're trying to cultivate your capacity for attention while you're doing it, you're cultivating your capacity to be present to what's not yourself. And um, so if you're studying Sanskrit, say, Sanskrit is not going to adjust to make itself easier for you, you know, it just <laughs> is what it is, and and you have to you have to grapple with it, and you have to learn to be present to something that's not you. And what Faye's claim, and it's it's a you know I think we could debate the claim, but what her claim is is that if you cultivate that kind of capacity for attention, you will be better able to be present to to others, meaning your suffering neighbor. And also God, who is other than you, and that's the but that's the claim that she's making. Um, yes. Um, first off, thank you all for kind of your three very distinct viewpoints. Mm -hmm. Really great, kind of diverse uh, words from all of you. Um, I'm curious if there's a readerly practice that any of you engage in to kind of complement the distinct writing practices that you all. Discussed. I know as an undergraduate, uh, for better or worse, I do a lot more reading than writing with my studies. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if there's any uh, practice of reading that you can engage in um, to help with your writing. Um, I, I would say just outrageous rereading. I mean, reading really is rereading. Um, so just over and over and over and over re-engaging with texts that are they're good. And of course, you have this constant uh, tension between breadth and depth. But if you had if you had to throw one out, you throw out breath. Like yeah. if you go deaf, because you can um, only write as deeply as you can. Uh, and I think most people read more than they write. I think. I think. At different stages of life, though. I mean, I'm not reading deeply right now. I'm a very, very small child, but for much of my life, just it um, pages read outnumbered the pages written by thousands. <laughs> I think you can, you can I, um, I think there's there's more than one way. I think you can you can read as you can read differently as a writer um, than you would as a student of literature. Mm -hmm. um, and I have the uh, B minuses and Cs to prove it. Because I came when I came back, I came here, when I came here I was like so I was like, oh, I'm gonna uh, I'm going to take a, a, a literature and theology class with this brainy Lutheran dude. Um, that's going to be great. And he was like, what are you, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Why can't you read? <laughs> but I can read. And he was like, um, uh, but the way, I, the way I learned to read um, by the people who had the most influence on me was to look, to read, um, to understand how, why, like not, uh, to like really, it was like nuts and bolts. How did that? How did that? How did they do that? Yeah. How did that sentence just work that way? Um, and that's and it's a sort of it's a, it, it, it can it probably and it probably has to at some point become an extremely selfish way and kind of predatory um, um, way to read because you're just sort of 
uh, trying to uh -huh, uh -huh, <laughs> trying to find to like discern what people's yeah. method is, yeah. and then steal it, adopt it, and have it yeah. um, <laughs> until it, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, hopefully um, mm -hmm. um, it will. You'll, you'll put it aside as you start to put your own yeah. as you as you come to your own your, your own identity. It's reading with an eye towards narrative theory at all times. It's the nuts and bolts of how narratives are constructed and all the formal elements of construction. And you're filling a toolbox, <coughs> essentially. Uh, it's a writerly way to read, and it's very nuts and bolts. I'm probably the, I'm more of a reader on this panel than I am a writer. These guys are fantastic writers. But um, I'm really interested in using religious reading practices to read um, all kinds of texts. And, um, Terry and I were on a pilgrimage this summer where we read to the lighthouse and, and we used um, Lexio Divina and Habruta and part of Jewish and Christian reading practices. It was kind of like lowering a ladder into that novel and you know, taking one sentence and trying to go, you know, deeper and then a little bit deeper and then a little bit deeper. And I wasn't I was thinking of it I was thinking of it as a reading practice to help my reading and to help my understanding of Virginia Woolf. But I'm sure those practices would help you also become a better writer. Um, there's, I think our favorite practice on that pilgrimage was a practice called Florilegium, which is something medieval monks used to make. They would um, read scripture or Anthony or the, you know these desert monks or whatever text they were reading, and they would pay attention to which sentences would sparkle up at them out of the text. And sometimes they would call these collections books of sparklets. And um, what happens is when you write all your sparklets down each day, at the end of the day you have a new text. And uh, my father does this. Every day he reads six psalms and he just listens for the verse that's going to speak to him in this moment, on this day, this time in history. And he writes it down in a little notebook so he'll have six verses in there every day. And once you have that, then you have a new song. Yeah. You know, that's it's like uh, Alejandra's um, redoing of shattering and reformulating of, of Simon Bay or in the Bay Saint Phillips, um, you know, finding a way to tell that lost story out of the one document that's left. Um, and I think those are great writing practices because it shows the fluidity between reading and writing and the way reading and writing really it's really hard to separate them, I think, in, the, in those kinds of things. Um, and really it's hard to separate reading and writing. So I think there's some great religious reading practices. Sure. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your insight. So I like write a lot of sermons, right? So I'm trying to expand on that. So like when you write, like you seem to be very interesting to me. <laughs> <laughs> When you write, yeah, I'll move this way. <laughs> when, you, when you begin, are you looking at your audience or is your audience looking at you? Uh, you mean with by audience the, the field know, of where potential we readers? Be. I don't know. Um, I think I am, they follow, the, whoever it is at first, they fall away. Usually there's a, it starts with a particular person or it has always with the, uh, with, with the novel. So, uh, and sometimes, you know, you, Someone starts reading the novel, I'm like, well, oh, you're really mad at your mom, aren't you? And it's true that it's dedicated. Um, uh, and often it's the person to whom the novel is, the, 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 the piece is dedicated is the one with whom I start the conversation, but it very rapidly. Uh, and so if there's something, and, and sometimes it's, and there, there's an aspect of that, there's something I want to, maybe this goes back to that, that, that memoir question, there's something I want to say to you that is not at all amenable to ordinary language, and I'm going to have to tell you a really long story to try and get it across. Uh, and somewhere uh, it becomes, uh, I mean, it, it, it at the same time becomes no more complicated than that, I guess, and then it's also much more complicated than that if something else is, um, uh, if there's something else, um, yeah, become, if, if, if there's some kind of um, gravitational force to the story that starts to pull more and more um, into itself, or just, you know, just get out of hand, I guess. Um, uh, but yeah, they are the, the, and the, and yeah, that, that person, is, I guess, is always in mind, and then also 
um, he starts to get to speak in some ways himself because there's some part of them that's alive in me. So for them, I mean that sometimes that that person who starts the conversation is uh, is dead. I think we'll take one more question. Emily, you've had your hand up, so. Uh, and this sort of addresses many of the topics that have been touched on, but I'm wondering if you, you could um, address the question of writing and permanence, because there's the, or, or longevity, because there's the writing for yourself and then tearing it up, but there's the writing for the audience, the public. And I'm particularly struck because Kentrich's work on this um, Rome is intended to disappear. Right. He defines yeah. it as ephemeral. Yeah. And I sort of just was thinking yeah. about this today up yeah. in the, the CSWR library about what it means to have a work of art that's yeah. ephemeral. I mean, the whole writing is sort of there for the ages, yeah. and the fact that we can read Anthony or his biographer yeah. or Augustine, we can't talk to him, but we can read him. But this Kent, the Kentridge Roman uh, uh, tribulations, uh, yeah. lamentations, and triumphs, if you don't get to it's Rome gone. in the next year, it's gone. It's gone. Right. No, it's a great question, and um, it makes me think again of, to the Lighthouse, Virginia Woolf's novel, because she's looking at these two artists, Mrs. Ramsey, who creates her art out of food and conversation and people, and she gathers them around her table, and they, you know, they really have a transcendent experience together. They make art together, and then at the end of the night, she looks behind her, you know, at the room, and it's already gone. It's already disappearing. So her art won't be remembered. It's gone. And um, Lily Briscoe, who is painting Mrs. Ramsey, she thinks to herself, this painting's going to be rolled up and put under some <coughs> sofa. Um, it's not going to hang in a museum. So why why am I doing it? But at the, in the end, she, she says, I've had my vision. I, I absolutely have to have this vision. And I think um, I think all, all art is ephemeral. We are ephemeral. Um, and there are a few things, you know, we remember those things that Kentridge captures on that wall, or um, we remember Anthony because Athanasius wrote his biography, um, but there's so much more art that's just gone, and that's what I mean. That's what I'm wondering about, is how do we remain present to that? Um, and, and even though, like, Mrs. Ramsey's art is ephemeral, um, it, it was there in the world, and people experienced it. So what, does it mean there's no lasting effect because it won't, there's no way to put it between covers, or there's no way to hang it on a wall? I'm not sure. I think, you know, these things have their effects in the world um, in ways that we can't always comprehend. This strikes me as a good definition of vocation, that which we do despite the Despite, <laughs> right. Despite it'll be rolled up so we can. Now, if, if, if what you must still do yeah. may very well be your vocation. It may sound a little bit like clap for Tinkerbell and she'll come back to life. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I think that whatever that, if I'm, whatever I was trying to say about um, that my, my teacher sort of did it like a vampire. Cassie making me into something uh, like her because of what she gave me <laughs> this, this aspect of this, this curious kind of attention um, and if what if that, if what that meant for me was that oh I'm not just I'm not just me um, there's something else there I think that I have this, this suspicion or hope I guess that 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 all of that that everything that everything that comes and goes for me doesn't come and go for whatever else there is there is something that it's all held. I mean, maybe, 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 one way of saying it's not all for nothing, oh. but maybe it's really not all for nothing, because it doesn't, because it's there forever, and forever doesn't even mean what we think it does. Right. Mm. Well, in the record, I was sort of God's memory in that perception.
session, you know, care, holding everything that can't be remembered. This is Ramsey's dinner party. <laughs> All of it. What is life but an ephemeral work of art? I mean, we are all going to die. Um, <laughs> on that note, uh, thank you, Katie, Stephanie, Chris, for your time, for your wisdom. Um, I have a favor to ask the crowd, which is do not try to waylay Katie. She needs to be somewhere urgently. She has a toddler who needs her right now. So we're gonna let ta we're gonna we're gonna speed Katie out, okay? Um, thank you all. Join me, please, in, in thanking our panelists.